Hey guys, welcome to the HYM podcast, the podcast talking about all aspects of motorsport from four wheels to two wheels and everything in between. I'm your host, Nick Yellowly, BMW factory driver, and I'm joined by fellow Brummy and host Jake Hughes, Rocket Venture Formula E reserve driver, and also producer Alex Murley, ex World Supersport drive, rider. So, on today's episode, we have somebody I'm really looking forward to speaking to. Um, he started his career in the days of Formula BMW before moving into Formula 3 and eventually into the world of GT racing, where he's been a factory driver for BMW since 2014. So it's here to talk about that, how he got into racing, plans for the future and all of the above. It's Mr. Jens Klingman. How are you doing, sir? Good. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you and have a little Thanks. chat. Yeah, thanks for coming on, mate. I mean, we know each other relatively well as of uh, 2018. I think we the first time we we spoke, but let's rewind it back a little bit and yeah, tell us about how you got started with this crazy journey that we're on at the moment. <laughs> so yeah, I just turned 30 last year. And I think I started racing probably like you when I was uh, quite young. I think I my father bought me a go-kart. I remember the day when I was five, oh, yeah, five years old. And I was, now I'm quite tall, as you know, <laughs> yes. but back then I was uh, quite short and uh, very light and skinny. And I was really afraid of, of going to the go-kart track. And uh, that was when I was there, yeah, like five, six years old. And then our friends, they had a little farm next to Heidelberg, next to Hockenheim Ring, yeah, where yeah, I initially yeah. come from. And I was so scared of taking it on the racetrack. So I just uh, drove it at the farm, just in circles. And then at some point I felt ready and we went to the go-kart track in, in Waldorf where also back then already Sebastian Vettel started his career. Not exactly there, but he was also one of the guys racing there in the Bambini class. And that's uh, where, where I picked it up basically. And you know yourself when you're young, then you just do it as a kind of a hobby and you have a little bit of a passion for it, but you obviously don't know what you get into all of a sudden. And then it just was was growing there from there on, to be honest, and cutting a long story short and up to to go karts, uh, Italian Open, which was a good thing back then, and even European Championship, and then I won the German Championship also, and then from 16 onwards, I basically jumped into Formula BMW, where I probably set the basics uh, for being back with them since 2014, won the first year as a rookie, rookie champion, uh, and won the, the championship in the second year, and we had good drivers there, like uh, Marco Wittmann was one of the drivers, uh, Christian Vitoris, who used to be to race DTM with Mercedes and some other good guys. And um, yeah, then moving on to Formula 3, where I didn't probably have the best uh, best car back then was also the first year with Volkswagen. And then I also realized that at some point, if you want to earn money with this sport, uh, because then it was, I was about yeah, 18, 19 years old. Then I moved into GT racing. I was really lucky enough um, to get invited back then by, um, first of all, it was uh, BMW Alpina. And they invited me to do a test in in, in Manicou. And I think I did well. I, I was just driving. I had no, no idea of how to treat a race car or if the shifting was good or whatever. I had no clue about uh, balance. I just drove and it was good. But then um, I raced a couple of races with them, but I didn't race the full season in GT Masters. And then, yeah, cutting now a longer story, really short. I ended up with Audi for some years, GT Masters. And now I'm back with BMW since 2014 and hopefully um, we both will stay there for for many more years to come yeah exactly right mate i mean i'm sure we will do uh being a bmw is a, a great thing and a great series of it's the people best manufacturer there. yeah it's the best manufacturer by miles the yeah, oh. exactly by miles so it's clear I, yeah <laughs> jake might have a little objection with that <laughs> with his have to be a bit careful <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, in general, um, GT Sport, actually, I didn't realise that you had started so young. So for me, I was actually 15 when I started, so quite late. And Jake as well was 15. Um, when did you start racing in bikes, Alex? I actually uh, never asked you. So I was, oh, uh, 2012 was my first season. Yeah, so I was 12, 13 when I started. 12, 13. Yeah. Okay, okay. So yeah, yeah. So it's amazing relative, different people. Yeah, relatively. I think, you know, the three of us, we were relatively, in terms later, you two were a bit later than me, but I was, I was still a latecomer to the bike side of it. So, um, yeah. so yeah. yeah it's, it's interesting how it all plays out. And then, Jens, mm -hmm. you say that you actually figured out, at a, I mean, a young age of 18, 19, that you wanted to become a professional driver. You wanted to earn some money, which, yeah, it's obviously what everyone wants to do, but be a professional racing driver is the main thing. Um, why did that decision come about? Was it lack of funds in, in, in the formula cars? Because that's a, you know, a big 
big thing or was it just that you preferred the G2 side of mm, That's a very good question. Actually, I, I think I have never talked about this to be honest before, so that's, that's a good but point. Yeah, mate. <laughs> yeah, you raised a really good point. I think to be very honest, um, the Formula 3 didn't go so well. And back then it was Hülkenberg, Valtteri Bottas was there, Alex Sims, uh, whatever, Charlie Kimball who races now IndyCar, um, probably I forget most of the big names. Eduardo Matara was there, but so really, really good guys. Good it was guys. super competitive, yeah. and you had to had to be really spot on also in terms of um, well, every in terms of everything, but also the car and the engine, everything. And then the second year I could have done because back then I had a manager, but he had a good contact. Then um, also to first of all to Audi in first place, and when I was at Volkswagen, um, they also gave me then later a shot with Audi. But it just it just turned out I had always a favor of touring cars, and even when we went testing with Formula Three, and I even saw the the Porsche Cup cars driving with us in in a different class, I, I thought I, I would at least want to give it a try because it felt like it's it's really cool and it looks cool from the outside. And then it was I never really thought about okay how to earn money with it. It was just a, a natural process of a transition from Formula cars to GT cars, and then doing GT Masters. And obviously at the beginning I didn't earn any money with it. I just tried to no. make it work somehow and then the very first money I earned also with Audi when when um, they once invited me to come to Ingolstadt and they said okay we want you to race um, for us in the with a Quattro car it was back then a front wheel driven car it was a TTRS with Tom Cech and Frank Bieler so also okay. really big names and then Michael Ammermüller and then I was already curious when they come up with the budget and I said okay so regarding the budget so what's the deal and then I really said wow Budget is very difficult. And then they said, yeah, we thought about giving you 2,500 euros for the real envoys. And I was like, oh, yeah, coming shocked. my way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was like, yeah, finally, I was like, okay. <laughs> sounds, sounds, sounds good, yeah? Yeah, okay, yeah, well then, let's do it, let's do it. <laughs> and I was really surprised. And then I finally earned the first money, obviously, then we did three, four races, but at that age, I felt like I was a millionaire almost, you know, yeah. I finally could, could buy my, my my shirts myself and go out for dinner myself and that was a big step but it was just a natural transition to be honest coming from from formula racing do you think do you think that was kind of like the turning point because obviously i don't want to say a brave decision but it's different at the age of 18 sort of 19 to to be in formula three yeah. and want to want to look to do something in, in the world of gt and, and sports cars and endurance because you know we all kind of get into it with the dream of f1 and then at different yeah, points sure. along the way the guys that don't get there we find out that that's not going to happen so do you think that was that was kind of your turning point when yeah. they kind of offered you that yeah 100 percent. at the beginning i didn't feel so uh, well the success doesn't come along very quickly then you feel like okay was this the right choice or not but in the end i have to say it was for sure the turning point and now as i get a little bit older doing this for quite some years now i wouldn't want to do anything other than gt racing anymore i feel so well, where I am, and also what Nick already knows, developing now the M4 GT3 and so many more perspectives you all of a sudden get, like doing some PR for managers, and you know yourself, it's a, it's a big field of what you can do other than just going fast for one lap. And that was clearly a turning point. I'm very glad that it turned out that way. But as we all know, in racing, I think sometimes you also have to be really lucky to be at the right spot at the right time. And also when BMW then gave me the first contract at the beginning, it was not not like, the works contacted, they just said, do a race for us. And all of a sudden, one morning I woke up and I had a contract about doing one real end race in the 24 hour race of Nürburgring. And I said, okay, this can be, can be good finally. Yeah, it can, it can change, you know, super quickly as well. I mean, yeah. from my experience as well, I did my first race with BMW as a one-off. In fact, you were there, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure, 2018 in Silverstone with- um, I was off. there. Yeah, you yeah, were there. But you so. did amazing from the first lap already on once. <laughs> yeah, well, that was, I knew the track well, so, and it just, yeah, th that helped and everything. But it's amazing that I actually did that quite late on that. Again, 2018, mm -hmm. I'd already been racing since 2005, 2006. 2018, I was 26, 27. So it's quite a lot later that I'd moved over from single seaters to, to the GT side. And Jake actually at the moment is in the, the process of becoming a professional driver. He gets paid already, but in GTs, most mm -hmm. likely, um, or maybe Formula E, we'll, we'll have to see how it all plays out for him. But um, as I've been speaking to him a lot, and he knows that in in, G, in the GT world, I've never had so much fun ever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in single seaters, there's so much pressure. You're 
you're breaking the bank here, there and everywhere, but it's more the, the fun and the tracks you get to go to the endurance side that I've been explaining is super good. So our question for you would be, is the Nordschleife the best track in the world for, for one <laughs> and, and two, the endurance side of things, is that your favorite or is it still the sprint sprint style? Um, so as you won it last year, it could have been my favorite track, <laughs> but as you ended up winning it, it's maybe it's not as good as it could have been because you know yourself, you love Sorry, the tracks man. where you where you where you have success, and obviously those are the tracks you you like to come back. But it's for sure one of uh, my very favorite tracks. Is I think the most challenging track on the planet. I would say so, even the length and without having any runoff. And when I started racing the Nordschleife, I felt like going ninety percent or ninety five percent you end up being super fast. And nowadays it feels like if you go only 99%, you're really obviously too slow. It's like a qualifying lap every race. So coming back to the question, I would prefer the endurance stuff to be honest, because I think it's just um, the next level in terms of you need to share the car with a teammate. So it's a proper teamwork. You need to manage the car, you need to manage the tire. And it's a little bit of a different story than just having a short sprint race. You can play with the strategy. But in the end, like on the Nordschleife, as we know, it is just a sprint race in the end. It's just a sprint race over 24 hours. I think that makes it so special. That's why I would always prefer the Nordschleife. I think this year, uh, hopefully we have another shot, not together as far as we know. No, but maybe not. Maybe we can turn around this year and make the Nordschleife my number one track then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. The, the you won it time. last year, mate, so give me yeah. a shot now. Yeah, your turn now. <laughs> you, can't be, you can't be too selfish, mate. <laughs> um, no, the, only, yeah. the only time I've ever raced a car with a roof over my head, um, and I think it's something I mentioned in a previous episode, um, it was actually in a BMW. I was part of the, the BMW mm. junior team in 2014, where it was his first year. Um, mm -hmm. And they put us in um, the 235i. Um, yeah. And it was, it's like this, you probably, um, you probably developed it, but it's just like this road car yes. basically with the seats <laughs> stripped out. Um, still, yeah. got the, still got the DSG gearbox in it and it's the stick and, and the center console and stuff. But I remember going on the Nordschleife and it was just, it was a different world to what I've done at that point. It was just like, mm -hmm. you know, one half the track was pure dry on slicks and the other half was wet, like monsoon rain um and it was the first lap i've ever done on it like just i was like this is to be honest you felt a bit out, out of your depth to begin with i don't feel like that's bad in saying that i think it's probably i still do now mate do. i wouldn't uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but the thing is you you and a gt3 and i'm like when i was in that two three i wasn't even it's not even a gt4 you know you see yeah. these gt3s coming past you and they look like they're going formula one car speed mm. yeah but let I me tell you one thing let me tell you one thing on a gt3 car it's almost easier because it's way faster, but you have so much platform and so much control and it's more precise that in the M2, or now it's the M2 CS racing, uh, since this year, there's more roll and it's not as precise and there's so much movement in the car, which also already scares you kind of. And with GT3 mm. car, it's just more straightforward, I would say. So I would rather do it in a GT3 car going faster, but pushing hard. Then ending up with a with an M2 or a slower car because I think those cars even not even the BMW just in general I think they might end up being more difficult than a GT3 car to be honest. So actually, you experience the worst already with a half yeah. track, yeah, being dry sure. and wet on top. I'm not sure it can be harder than end of the race on Pirellis in GP3. <laughs> GP3, <laughs> no, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It depends, man, because sometimes also with the GT3 comment, it's you're always doing the overtaking. Whereas if you're like a two three five. You're trying yeah. to do some overtaking of yeah. the small cars and then watch your mirrors at the other cars, the GT3 cars lunging you. And I, I did, um, I think my first or second race at the North Shaft was in a 235. And I remember I had to do, I think it was Joel Oaks and he couldn't come or, or didn't come to the to the race. So I did four hour on my own in a 235. And that's the most tired I've ever been, I think, getting out of a car. Mentally, I was just done. And that's where mm -hmm. the Norwich life really gets you more than anything is the mental concentration when you're in the night, in the rain. Like last year, Jens, I mean, mm. that was horrible a lot of the time with the dark. And I For mean, me, it was actually not so bad. <laughs> Did you not <laughs> no, do too much in the dark? <laughs> or was it, was it, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> no, I did some for me. Dark, yeah. You did some yeah. in the dark because for yeah. me, that was my first time actually in the dark properly at the noise life. And then it rained, the race was. So I was shitting myself, if I'm honest. Yeah, sure. It's very difficult, especially. As you said, in the night, you cannot see where the water is standing and the amount of water is difficult to judge. And then all the lights, maybe you end up with a GT3 behind you and all of a sudden you just see 
see white from the mirrors and it's it's that's another aspect why it's so challenging i think on the notch life yeah no i completely agree so if we take it back to how the bmw thing started you said you did some yeah formula bmw so i guess the first contacts and, mm -hmm. and them recognizing you was from there then your yeah. first gt experience with them was was what m6 uh, no back then it was a six series it was the b6 gt3 mm -hmm. with alpina back then and then um, it was the Z4 GT3 already. Back then, and how was that? We drove it for another three years. Oh man, that car! You would have loved it. It yeah. was from well, if you if you compare with the new car now or even the M6, it was an old car, but it was amazing to drive. We had massive aero, so a little bit like the M6. Uh, the power was not extraordinary. It was a little bit of our weak point, but it was so good to drive. Then the M6 was a huge step forward with a proper traction control and better ABS and everything. But the car itself, and especially the engine sound, was amazing, man. It's, it was really good. It I sounds it. it sounds next level. Unfortunately, I haven't driven one yet, but I keep asking if there's any like a classic car. You know, can I just yeah. jump in and do some laps? That that team that we both know, AAI, have one in yeah. Sepang. Uh, that's ready to go but we couldn't rent the track when i was out there to to let me have a go so i'm still waiting and nagging for that, that opportunity to drive one because they just sound so cool yeah you have to for me as a tall driver it was more difficult to get in because the car was so short and the cockpit was really really narrow let's say even the driver change was quite complicated then but the car itself was very basic talking of 2021 20, standards now very basic but as i said back then it was a was a beast and had also good success. It didn't win the 24 hours of Liverpool, by the way, unfortunately. A couple of times we were really close to winning it, but it never happened. But I think we won some other major races. So it was a good car. I really enjoyed it. Successful enough. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. When you also, um, Nick tells me, the, the first guy under eight minutes at the Nord's life. Mm. That was a um, lap. Yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> Just you. dropped the mic. Yeah. <laughs> It, I didn't know back then that only counts when you do it in the race. And in the qualifying, we ended up with 8-0 or 8-0-1. And then I did the start of the race and I was pushing so much to do a short stint and to have only like not even half a tank just to be able to break the record. And then they said, yeah, but we also want to win the race. So you have to start with the full tank. And then with the traffic, you know, you have maximum two laps and then you hit the, the back markers from the other groups, the slower cars. So I knew I had to get it done in, in lap one or two. And lap one with a very slow rolling start, you lose like one to two seconds from the start line already to turn one because you start so slow. And then I did like A0, zero, zero point, like really low, like 0.2 or 0.3. So I just missed a couple of tens. And then I already thought like, come on, you gotta be kidding me. That was so close. <laughs> and then the second lap, uh, I really, I, that was the first time I did the Flugplatz flat back then. It was a little bit more of a crest. And I thought now I have to get it together. That's the only chance I have. And then onto Döttinger Höhe, we didn't have predicted lap time, but we had a running lap time. So you can already check like on the Döttinger Höhe on the bridge where you are roughly. And I felt like that was, was good. I had a good chance. And then I saw like two small and really slower cars at the back markers of the other group. Um, and that I'm about to lap them. And that was in the very last corner in the last chicane. And I thought, no way <laughs> that they're going to destroy my lap. And then... Yeah, you have to judge whether inside or outside and last last corner I, I thought okay i tried on the outside and they left the, the gap open luckily and then it was like a seven ah to be honest i don't remember exactly but it was below eight it was a seven fifty nine zero for something i believe you said maybe you should have it was... tattooed on it <laughs> yeah really <laughs> and... i thought about it to be honest yeah, yeah. yeah. and obviously like, some... like here, you know? yeah <laughs> definitely <laughs> obviously some people wouldn't even know that that includes the gp lap because everyone associates yeah. norge like or nurburgring yeah. times as like you know a road park and do it less than seven minutes but that's not the full yeah. including the gp loop either no that would no i think it would be like a 620 or something 625 it would be on the on the, on the normal lap Back then it was super fast. The track is currently changing like every year. So they repave some parts. There's more grip. It's less bumpy. But back then a 7.59 was really, a really, really good time. I think so, now it still is a good time because the horsepower got reduced and the arrow even further. Back then, um, yeah, it's it's still fast. Let's say it's still fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fast. I mean, it's super fast. But what were the top speeds? Because I only got into my first GT3 race was 2019 BLM3 with Schnitzer and mm -hmm. Sheldon. Um, so already the BOP was quite, you know, as in engine power was really quite reduced compared to everything else. Do you know what top speeds you were doing, say, down the dotting hood in back in Z4 days? Or I think it was roughly the same, to be honest. I think probably the pool was a little bit better. 
and we ran lower. So the error was also better. But I think the top speed itself in a very high end probably was, was quite the same, I would say. I would like to tell you 300, but that would be a lie. So. <laughs> yeah, it would sound really cool as well. Yeah, it? <laughs> yeah the 300 on that lap, but just on, on the, that lap. <laughs> on that lap. It's 59 is super nice, fast. Yeah. For the listeners that, that don't or haven't driven around that circuit, I, yeah, I think it's the best place in the world. I, there's nothing like it, particularly if you can get that clear lap, because there's not many laps that you actually get around there where you don't really overtake anyone or you only overtake one or two cars. It's always the first couple of the laps when you're on full tanks, apart from mm -hmm. if you do qualifying for the 24 and then you have yeah, you everything. Did. And you can just you send did it. last year. Yeah, that's the first time I've had nothing to overtake. It was quite, it was weird, actually. I felt really alone on the out lap in particular, where you're trying to find your, try and find your way and look, because, you know, you've probably only got one lap to get it bang on. Um, mm -hmm. to look exactly where all the wet dry bits were if it was like it was last year and then just yeah send it and hopefully you stay on the circuit <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so what, i think you send it quite well <laughs> what, what's your what's your fastest lap around the north life nick um i've done 759 something at low 759 and that was i think in one of the qualifying races the start of last year and me and when martin was chasing me i can't remember um but i think we did basically the same lap time and on that lap we got overtaken by an audi that was no. flying <laughs> on that lap we got overtaken and still did the 759 he was flying it must have gone past me at 10 kph faster um but at the time in, in those qualifying races every manufacturer is told to do what they can um not all do at the at the right point but so then at least it can be even by the six hour and the 24 and they can get the bop and the power somewhat yeah, just right mm. yeah, yeah exactly yeah my, my best lap time though isn't quite as quick no, no maybe not in a oh. three, five. <laughs> <laughs> i didn't want to ask you jake i've seen i've since been in a road car in a lotus elise i'm not one of those um i think you call it tourist and farting or yeah. or something yeah, when yeah. you know it's like a toll road for for a few hours or something and it's yeah, it's <laughs> some of the some of the stuff you see turn up there <laughs> yeah all <laughs> sorts crazy that's that's the thing about the launch life isn't it the whole experience that's why we were talking about it being the best race in the world. Hopefully we can have fans back this year. Let's see our fingers crossed. I don't know what the situation is like in Germany with this COVID end, but with us, we are looking like we are starting to come out the end of it. So they're hopefully thinking, you know, June time, we should be you know, relatively back to the, whatever the new normal is, hopefully exactly the same. So then we can have fans, maybe a few out on an outdoor, outdoor setting by the time the 24 hour comes. I hope so. I don't know exactly, obviously, but uh, they just uh, read on the newspaper. We just read on the newspaper that they are they are thinking of uh, how do you call it in English, like uh, going back to the normal life a little bit to, yeah. to change the rules a little bit that you can be outside. Some stores are reopening already, so I think it's it's going a good way. And I would also hope that there are some fans back because mainly on the North Life, the event is just so much better when there are fans and because they're all over it. And if if it will be back to normal. Nick, we have to go for a lap on, on Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah, on Wednesday or Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, just yeah. around the track, even with a bike, and just say hello to the fans because you will see it's just a massive party and they they have so much fun. They appreciate the drivers coming around. And we should definitely do that. Yeah, it's, man, we should because we didn't get to do... I haven't done it yet because 2019, yeah. unfortunately, our car uh, was... Well, well, I think most of the cars, unfortunately, for BMW were out by, you know, hour three, hour four. Mm -hmm. And then last year there were no fans. So mm. as an ex whole experience, you didn't get, you know, the parade or anything like that. So for sure we need to mm. do that. Isn't isn't it and now you're racing when I saw isn't it Sorry? brunching where all the like the party goes off, basically? It also, but it's pretty much everywhere, I would say. Like a couple of years ago, <laughs> I took my took my bike out for for not a lap on the track, but around the lap just to see some campers and uh, even have a beer with uh, some of them. <laughs> and it was Tuesday afternoon, I remember, and the party was on. I can tell you that was like a massive party. I think some of them, they don't even know the outcome of the race because they start partying early in the week. But that's just part of it. And they were so happy. And, ah, your driver. And, ah, cool, come over. And everybody is like not willing to help, but it's a big community. And they are just enjoying the racetrack and, and even the race. And I think most of them are around for many, many years. And, so us probably winning 2010 already with the M3 GTR, but then GT2 and yeah, it's just a big, big community. And um, I think that's also what we miss in racing, just the spirit of it and the people that they're cheering for us and they're clapping and enjoying what we are doing. Because in the end, it's also, also entertainment, you know. 
yeah. it's all about all about the fans and for the noise life like you say you have almost different cults so you'll have like bmw massive fanboys mercedes massive fan base you know different manufacturers different classes mm-hmm. that everyone maybe takes allegiance to slightly so then those fans if a bmw goes by all have the flags up and they're, and they're waving and it's really <laughs> like nothing else i've ever seen yeah. in my life which is yeah. super cool and yeah i mean racing wise like i say it's the one of the best things i've ever done but going back to your your racing career obviously most of it's been with bmw since you've gone yeah. you know you've been in gt3s what has been obviously you've had a load of highlights you've you've had podiums and wins at some huge races but what has been say your favorite season was it out in the states was it in asia in europe what do you think i mean i think i know what you're going to say but it'll be good for the, the <laughs> listeners to uh, i to know hear. that you know what i'm going to say <laughs> so that my future favorite season will be with you Thank hopefully you, one day yeah. we'll make it back uh, together yeah <laughs> well, look at this to, <laughs> to look ahead no i think um once a special race just race that comes to my mind was Petit Le Mans with the Z4 GTE. It was pouring down. I haven't driven the car for, I just drove it in Daytona and Sebring. I haven't driven it for half a year. I have never been to road Atlanta and I have never driven the car in the wet without ABS. And I got in the car practice one for like 10, 15 laps. And then I got back in the car for the race for the third stint. Nice. And it was raining and I was so nervous because they were fighting for the championship for manufacturers championship and also for for i don't know it was endurance and even the the drivers i believe anyways they were fighting for championships and i was so nervous i was really shaking i was sitting there in the pits and it was raining and the cars were going off and it was massive aqua planning i i thought man that's gonna end in tears and i was really and then at some point i had to go in the car and then it took didn't take me a long time and then I, I overtook one of the corvettes who were then already whatever like fighting for a podium and then i overtook the second corvette and then i thought okay man this is going well and then augusto farfus was was in the lead then overtook augusto in the SS on the outside and then i was like man this is going well <laughs> it really was <well. laughs> I, I, I did a double stint they red flagged it and then it was lucas Lewis and john edwards with me in the car and I said, okay, obviously I need to restart the car because it's red flag. And then nobody wanted to drive again because it was so risky still. And then I said, okay, Jens, you know the track best. So you go out for another stint. And in the end we finished uh, second behind the Porsche but they were like two seconds faster. I left. And we finished second overall. So even in front of all the prototypes back then the DPIs. And I was so proud of myself because I felt like I overcame those difficult conditions. It cannot get any worse than that, other than the notch life, <laughs> by the way. And I was, even though we finished only second, but second overall in Petit Le Mans was, uh, was a very good achievement. And I was so proud of it. And I still have uh, actually this trophy uh, hey. that I still have here. It's Pride still of, full of champagne and a little bit dirty, but I think it's more, more so authentic. Like it. than, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Was that the uh, Nick Tandy one? In Nick Tandy won it back to yeah, that year remember it now, with the yeah. Porsches, but that was yeah. a hell of a race. And I think I personally like that. What Nick already mentioned earlier, what he thinks that I'm going to answer. I like racing in the US because the races are quite intense. That's awesome tracks like Laguna Seca, Daytona as a as a start of the year. Then uh, whatever Patilemo, Watkins Glen, Long Beach. We raced uh, almost in Los Angeles downtown. In Detroit downtown, it was awesome tracks. The community is great, and I just like the spirit of it. And you can always connect with a nice road trip as well and see yeah. a little bit of the US. And I learned a lot there, and I also enjoyed racing there a lot on the track, but also off the track. And I'm not saying that Europe is, is worse, it's different, but for me, I enjoyed racing in the US probably the most. And also, when we won the first race with the M6 there after being a, a big part of the development process there. We won in, in, in most spot the first race, which was the third race of, of the season, or fourth, doesn't matter. I finished second at Sebring that first year with the M6. It was a good achievement. And then uh, I was really proud of that as well. And that made it really special from the beginning onwards, basically. Uh, sure. I mean, the States thing, I was lucky enough, actually, partly thanks to you introducing me to Will Turner and, and then you being <laughs> busy for the, for the race in Sebring last year to go out yeah. last minute, having not been to Sebring. So you gave me some tips and, on how to work with the team and, and to drive the circuit, of course. But I loved it because for me, it's every time you get, well, not every time, but most times, if the situation allows, you get reset when there's a yellow flag. So you can yeah. have a 20, 25 second lead. And then it's all reset. You're all next to each other as in classes. So you've got your DPIs, your LMP2s, GTLM, and then your, your GT Pro or 
no, sorry, GTDs at the moment until mm -hmm. next year. And then it's like a race start every, say, hour, hour and a half if there's a caution, which is completely nuts. So you have to be on it all the time. And that's what I didn't appreciate in comparison to, to Europe, where they say maybe just full course, yellow it. And then it's, yeah, you sit mm -hmm. there for two or three laps doing 80 k's an hour, but then you have the same gap as long as you get on it good enough but the racing in america having only done one race is for sure where i'd love to just go and, and do a full season to see what it was like yeah i completely agree it's a little bit more rough it's a little bit more basic i would say the tracks are more they have less runoff which i also like it's not about yeah. saying ah, oh, it's maybe not as safe as europe but it's more challenging even racing in the streets like you did in monaco when you won one uh, back then i mean it's just a different kind of challenge a different kind of approach and no tire heaters, you know, you're going to send it on the outlet. You can play with the strategy because a normal race is two hour 40s. Um, then you have uh, yeah, several scenarios, as you said, with a full course yellow where it resets because they don't have only a full course yellow, they have the safety car then already. Yeah. So, um, because when you say full course yellow, you could also think that's like a like in GT works and we only do 80 behind each other, 80, and nobody's yeah, sure. closing the gap or, or opening a gap. And I think it's it's very challenging. It's very different, but um, same as you, I completely agree. It's uh, super fun, and hopefully, we can also make it back together at some point. Yeah, that'd be cool. I mean, I, I've never done it, but I kind of always always associated racing in in the US as kind of like sort of the best racing you might find be able to find in Europe or elsewhere, but without kind of the politics. I don't know if that's kind of true, um, but that's how it kind of looks to me from the outside watching them. And I don't know. It just look. It just looks like it's like you say. It's pure racing a bit more. Yeah, I'd I'd say that you're 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 right in a way. As in, it definitely looks like that. But it's mostly because it's so stripped back. So they're not bothered about the garages looking perfect with all yeah. the bullshit boards and everything like that. It's mm. just proper racing. They turn up. The cars are ready. You know, you drive to the pit lane. You don't. You know, you have your old pit box stand. Uh, I mean, Jens knows more about this, but you actually sit on top next to the engineers during a whole race. Well, I did because I just wanted to see what was going on. It was so fun and there was so much going on. And you've got a, a special created pit stand where the drivers sit behind the engineers and watch all the screens. And it's just old school, which like the tracks, the racing's old school the strategies. It's much more old school. And for me, now I'm 30 as well, um, liking the old school more and more. Yeah, and what um, obviously now with the, I thought Ems are obviously the first ones to do it. Now we're changing the GT regs, um, so that now there's no GTLM, which is GTE in um, in obviously Le Mans and ACO, and they're going to basically a GT3 regulation. Um, so what what's kind of your thoughts on that? I mean, it looks it looks good to me. Uh, I think it's good because I think it offers a wider platform for the teams because GTE was quite limited to manufacturers as well. And also I think the budget was a big, big deal because you just needed so much money to make it happen. I think we will see probably more teams and better racing because I think GTD is one of the best classes there is, not even IMSA, but also on the planet because uh, first of all, so many different manufacturers and the people from outside, the spectators, the fans, they can still identify themselves with the brand, you know? Like our M4 is based on the M4 car, obviously the same with all or the other cars and i think the racing is just more spectacular because it's not like a proper prototype where you lose one one little flap and you have to you have to pit and then uh, do an extra pit stop i think uh, the cars can also hopefully take a little bit of of a, of a damage let's call it and it's just better for the racing itself and gentlemen drivers can race it uh, amateurs can race it uh, pros gonna race it obviously then and I think it really widens the platform and, and, and offers it also to the teams because even now with DTM switching to GT3 cars, okay, they don't have too many um, cars yet on the grid, but I think it's just a question of time and GT Masters is completely full the grid as far as I know. And I think GT3 in general is booming massively. So I think it's, a, in my opinion, a good, a good step forward as you can also race the cars all around the globe. You know, maybe they have a Pirelli like GT Masters. I don't even know what DTM is running. Then they have a Michelin and the IMSA. But other than changing the tire, you can basically run the car everywhere. And I think that's another point, which is really, um, really good for the teams on top. Yeah, cost effectiveness just seems to be the, the main thing. So to get manufacturers like BMW, like Audi, Mercedes to, to actually want to invest in these big programs, it, make it becomes a lot easier, particularly if they open up mm -hmm. um, like they did in IMSA with GT Pro. If they open up the WEC side and say mm. cancel GTE, or GTLM, GTE, whatever, um, and, and just put GT3 cards there, then like you say, you're going to be able to race, um, hopefully, teams with the M4 GT3 and, and get a lot of cars out there. 
and be able to win Le Mans outright, win Daytona outright, all at a relatively cost-effective base as amateurs or pros. So then, yeah, more cars will be sold. The racing will get closer because everyone's getting involved. So I think, like you say, Jens, it could be quite a, yeah, quite a big step, hopefully coming next year. Yeah, I hope so. It will be. I'm quite confident. I think it's, it's a good plan. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's for sure. It's kind of like what we said in another episode, wasn't it? That, you know, particularly in the context of sort of Le Mans and getting an entry for Le Mans, we'll have so many people that can now take their car to Le Mans, but will need to get an entry for it. That will, All of a sudden, the other championships yeah. will, will get more, more cars mm-hmm. in the grid as well. No, yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah, I mean, self-fulfilling, isn't it? The more cars that you have or more championships that you have running that car, then those, yeah, whoever is rewarded for doing well in those, yeah, get developed for, further forwards and get to do the big races. So it's just going to make competition better uh, in general and just be yeah, really quite cool. I think uh, I think also, if, you know, for the fans coming in to, to learn about GT3 racing as well, it's going to make it like more streamlined as well. So, you know, people from national, people watching national championships or stuff out in America or Europe, you know, they'll be able to see that and then go, well, the aim for those guys is Le Mans and stuff like that. So I think it's going to be, I think it's going to make it really interesting. Really interesting. I think it, I think it should do. So back to the back to the stuff with BMW. Obviously, you are a, the main guy or one of the main guys with the M6 development, um, being involved in all, all that sort of stuff. You do M4 GT4, 235, 23, well, the M2 CS. So you're the development king, particularly <laughs> on, on the BMW side. And now with the our new baby, the M4 GT3. So talkers, obviously, you can't give us too much detail on the M4. I understand that. But... Um, the process or, or what you really enjoy about developing a car, you can talk about the M6 yeah, more so. No, no. Oh, I understand <laughs> the point, mate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's 800 horsepower and only 900 kilograms. That's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's going to be great. No, I, I, I have the pleasure um, of really developing most of our race cars other than uh, Formula E and DTM. Um, but I really enjoy that a lot because uh, the example of the M4 when I was in the first workshop for the first time, for example, there was just the chassis. <clears throat> and then they came up with a steering wheel. It was out of the 3D printer. And then they said, how does it feel like? Just an example. So you, you take it and you think, ah, oh, for me, I would like to change this, that the other, the grip is not so efficient. It doesn't feel right. And then you come back in two weeks time and there are two, two further development steps done. And then you check out and then at some point, I think the fourth one, Roughly was then the one we went for, and also the button positioning radio should be up here because this is what worked in the M6 and then all that stuff. And then you see it coming together. And I think that's already one part which makes it really special. Even the first seats with the M6, they were carved out of, out of wood. We sat in it and we said, okay, this is quite comfortable, but maybe the seat should be higher because, for example, shorter drivers, when they put a cushion or like a kind of a pillow <laughs> underneath them and they want to sit higher just to have a better view outside the car. The seats should also be higher on the sides, you know, not to make them sit on top of the seat, but really have a good, good support or side support. And those little details that start coming together at some point but without driving one single meter on the, on the racetrack yet. But you can see it kind of grow from, from the get go. And when you then see it for the first time on the racetrack, um, <laughs> once again, makes me also proud being a small part of it. But obviously a driver is also, as we all know, not only a small part of it, you can just give the input and hopefully, um, it's the right decision also from our side, but it's very good fun just because you see it come together step by step. And also when I said in IMSA, when we won the first race in in, uh, in low spot, the first year with the M6, that was also, I really cried on the inner lap because it was so emotional after all those tests and then development tests and endurance tests you put in and all those journeys that you have experienced and all the good and bad days. And then all of a sudden you end up winning the first race. That's obviously also something that's really special. And with the M4, in regards to the M4, I can only, I'm not saying this because we are then here as a works driver, but the car is really good. It has to be, obviously, because the M6 is not the youngest car on the grid anymore, but the car has a lot of new functions which work already really great from the get-go. And I think it's always good if the, the basic of the car has to be awesome, let's say. If the base is already compromised and then you start building around that compromise, it can only go in a bad way. But the base of the M4 is really really, really super good. And it worked basically from the beginning when we went testing now last week, there was no downtime because the car had a technical failure or there was something broken. And I think it's very good that they can really focus on all the test points and really get them done. And we are already at a certain stage where 
luxury problems are really worth watching into. For example, we have a, a switch panel like the M6 on the right side and they have a background light. But when the sun is coming from the back, for some reason, you cannot see the colors of the background from the switch panel. If they like, like red for whatever ABS off, then it's just white, everything is white. But when I covered the switch board from the right side with a finger, and it gives a little bit of a shadow, all of a sudden, all the buttons were visible. And then I came to the pizza said, maybe we can just uh, put a little cover there. And then they made a really good one actually out of carbon from the straight away, took them only a couple of hours and had a massive, super nice carbon cover there. It looked like it's been, been there forever <laughs> from the beginning onwards. But it's nice that we can even take care of those little small things because as you know, they already, they also count at the end of the day. But if you're only stuck with the big issues for a long time, I think it's there you run out of time to, to care about the details and details is obviously the things who make the difference at the end of the day. So I can only tell you good things, but development is also really a part of um, part of the job, which I enjoy a lot. And as we all know, I see you very soon also um, as a part of the development and then you will see yourself and hopefully it turns out everything as I said, and you're not completely, uh, don't have another opinion on the things I just said. No, but no, I'm be, sure. Will I'm sure I'll honestly. agree, mate. If, uh, if you and Augusto have put it together, then I'm sure it'll be fast and, and all, all good. So I'm looking forward to that in a couple of weeks. I know from, yeah, like you say, from the start of it, you've been involved with that, but also you, you were involved with the M6. So um, mm. as a base, obviously everything develops as, as the world of motorsport does, but is it the same kind of things that you're looking out for in terms of, yeah, like you say, seat fit, button position, stuff like that? Or is it the technology now taking it to the next level where we can, I know we said we've been doing lots of laps, which is great. And we have the luxury of not releasing the car till, is it October time? something like that so there's still a lot of testing yeah. to be able to yeah. to go on before it goes to the customers which is great but is it the same kind of tendencies that you're looking for from the m6 to the m4 is there a whole different world i would say it's quite the same but it's i would say it's the same for for all the cars it doesn't matter if it's a gt4 or gt3 or, or even the m2 cs first of all it has to be easy to handle you have to sit comfortable your steering everything has to be self-explaining i would say because some drivers they don't use it on a regular basis like like we do even gentlemen drivers on the on the gt3 or gt4 it has to be easy to to operate the car i would say and i think that's already a good approach on the first approach and that has been the, basically the same with the m6 but the m6 we had some uh, it's not a secret some issues with the gearbox for example and then the cooling was not so efficient so we had to go up north to sweden to go testing just to to be able to test because otherwise the engine would have would have died and there were like a, a lot of things like big things that had to be solved before going in detail and that's why i mentioned it because now with the m4 you, you start the car you go and it drives you know there are no big problems or any problems and the beginning of the development, I can tell you, was just basically scanning because you have the car, it gets built on a piece of paper, it gets built with a computer. So you first of all have to check if the real data matches the computer data. So you put like different wing positions, you drive every possible position once, you match it with what you thought it would do just to make sure that it actually happens what it's supposed to do. And if it's not, then you have to have a look why it doesn't. Um, and that was the first step, to be honest. It wasn't about driving a particular lap time. It was just about driving the car, driving all kinds of setup, just to do some scans, like roll bar scan from very soft, to very hard, and just doing everything once with a lot of system and application stuff in the background. But now we are, that is all done. So now we really go into, into performance testing already and also then into the endurance running, because as we all know, this car doesn't have only to race for one hour in GT Masters, it also has to, to win the major endurance races, um, probably starting with Daytona in January 2022. And then it has to last 24 hours at least. So we do already some endurance testing very soon and, and make sure that it lasts because the sooner or the earlier we figure out when we have more time to change because at some point, middle of the year, you have to do the homologation as well. And then the parts are homologated so you cannot change too much again. Then we can only develop a smaller, smaller window. Um, and that's why I think it's already in a good schedule, at least for the moment. I've got to say from personal preference, I prefer the look of it compared to the M6 personally. Say again, sorry? I've got to say from a personal point of view, I yeah. prefer the, the visual of the M4 compared to the M6. Yeah, some people, that's, that's good to hear because some people, also when I saw the first pictures of the normal 4 Series for the street with this new grill with the kidney, I wasn't so sure and the people are really hating it on, the, on, the, on social media. But when you see the car in real life, also the normal 4 Series or M4 or M4 GT3, 
it looks really cool. And I think even the people who probably they hate it for now, they will get used to it. Even when the Panamera got launched, for example, I thought maybe it's not such a nice car and I, now I love it. I think it just takes a little bit of time, but in reality, it looks much better than on the pictures. On top I, of I, your opinion already. <laughs> I, I quite like the grill and the road car. Yeah, yeah mm. I like it. It's good to I hear. Think I, I think it looks really aggressive, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 It's what yeah. it wants to eat you when it comes yeah, exactly. from behind okay. and uh, watch from the you. mirrors. But well, wasn't yeah, exactly. it just going with your world, Alex, with bikes? Wasn't the um, was it Al Oliveira? He won one, didn't he? When he won yeah. the first the race in Red Bull Ring, yeah, so he'd have got MotoGP. the first production one. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. It's not that's Lucky not a bad. Him, man. That's not yeah. a bad day at the office, is it? You win your first race and then you get a nice new. Uh, it's yeah, it's better than the kick in the teeth. Oh, that because yeah. that was at the red. That was actually at the launch uh, mm -hmm. for the for the M4 and the and the GT3 because yeah. I think Philip was there doing some. Slow de demo laps with the, yeah. the launch of that with Dorna and the MotoGP and Marcus yeah. Flash. So that was that was yeah, all of that. And then you win it was the slow race. demo laps, uh, but it was already super fast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, lap compared record, to the like, Masters lap times. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very confident. May Very maybe confident. it's because it's Philip driving, not us. Uh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it can be. That's a good yeah, point. Maybe yeah. it can That's be. A valid point. Yeah, exactly. Nice, yeah. yeah. And, and how? And how about then? So if we talk about some of your highlights from from racing, you've like I said, you've been on the podiums, you've won plenty of races. If you could give me your top three sort of races, I know you've given me one, in order uh, and why, that would be quite a cool thing to for the fans to you know hear from your perspective. Yeah. Well, I have to think about it for a second. Yeah, well, I, I pick two different ones because I could easily say then uh, the second place at Sebring was really nice because it was the second race with the M6 and then the first win but I already mentioned that so I have to go for something else so <laughs> let, yeah, let look me at check. the trophies <laughs> <laughs> no, let me check. I have I have one one cool one because it was um, in Texas um, yeah Austin we didn't feel like we had a good car for the race it was my teammate's home race he lives in uh, in Austin and we started, I think, around P12, so I felt like, ah, it's going to be a long and difficult race. It was super hot. I got into the car, took over, and then all of a sudden, we were leading the race. And the car was really competitive, only in the race, but don't ask me why, but it was so fast. And then there was one more pit stop to do, and it was freaking hot. And my, my mechanic, who was supposed to exchange the drink bottle, because we only change it when the driver stays in the car. So um, my teammate had it all on the first stint so i didn't have anything to drink on the second stint and the third stint i was supposed to get a new drink bottle and he was so excited of the performance and that we're leading the race that he didn't connect the bottle he just oh. plugged it but it wasn't connected and i was sweating it was really really bad and really tough but when you're in the lead it's obviously a lot easier to 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 get motivated again and that was a really spectacular race because it was his home race and we really fun fact had a very nice party because he had a party organized unless of the outcome of the race with friends coming over and family and he had a really I still has a very super nice house there in the area and it was just nice winning the race from having no expectations when you go into the race then suffering a little bit but then kind of also earning the victory and then having a very nice party at his home was really super nice so that was maybe not the best races in my career but uh, a, a one I really remember and uh, what a good, was a good time and what else normally I would say Spa when you finish second just around 10 seconds uh, behind uh, the winning sister car which was uh, Philip Eng, Christian Kronis and Tom Blomke. Yeah, but then since it was with me in that year, uh, with okay, that year. when you finished second. Yeah. yeah, it was Kronis and Tom Blomquist and yeah. that was also a good race but actually believe it or not I would say GT Masters race two last year at the Red Bull Ring. Yeah. I really enjoyed that because you know yourself how difficult it is to win GT Masters, especially last year, struggling also there with many things, um, not only with the car itself, but also from the outside. And then yeah. winning at Red Bull Ring also meant a lot to me. That was really one of the highlights because also there, the car seems to be quick at Red Bull Ring, this we knew from the get-go, but when we came there, I said, if we had top eight in one of the races, I would, I would take that immediately. And then had a good qualifying. We both had a good start leading the race one and two. Just yeah. managing the tire and the race and then ending up winning was also one of one of the highlights i would say even though it's only a gt masters race but it's been so competitive gt masters in the last years and then having in mind that um, this was the only race weekend we were actually super competitive and then bringing it home with all the pressure because everybody's watching you at red bull ring and then that was also a really good one
Yeah. No, Thanks for not cool. overtaking me there. So <laughs> no, I can talk cool. about this now in a positive way. <laughs> Yeah, that was really cool. Your quality lap, I have to say, was mega because I thought I did a did a really good lap, and you were, I think, it was super close. The so top, did I. top five so were did like I. 0.045, I think I was off, and I was fourth. Yeah, I was like 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 two hundreds or something, like one and a half hundreds. I was off the pole. Yeah, yeah. one hundred was really exactly. close. Exactly. I should have all... gone for a P, then I could have it. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Just those couple know. of grams. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, no breakfast. <laughs> no breakfast. And then, and then we both uh, went. We'd already spoke about it actually, which is quite funny. We'd spoke about it because we were both starting on the left hand side of the grid on the outside, and he was like, "I'm going to go and try and go outside." And I was like, "Well, I'm going to follow you. So just make sure you get a good launch." And and funnily enough, we both came out the first corner <laughs> on the outside, completely like sideways and crossed up, but the power was yeah, pretty good as well. So we managed to get one a good run, and then and then the power as well, which was absolutely perfect so yeah it was, it was uh, so good yeah, you still owe me the sushi from saturday because we had an arrangement that whoever finished better if we both finish on the podium the higher position driver has to buy the other one sushi so yeah, exactly. he won on sunday and i finished third and then i won on sun uh, sorry he finished uh, one on saturday we finished third and then i won on sunday or we won on sunday so i bought the sushi on sunday but you still owe me the one from saturday I'm just say yeah, so now exactly. everybody knows <laughs> Just leave, sushi, that, right? just leave that one there we just do bet yeah we do betting on sushi and, that, and that's about it uh so if we move yeah if, if we move to to this year i know you can't talk again about too many plans but you know what are, to be honest, too many plans yeah it, it, that's the same for most people so as covid i would say affected you like it has most most people as well in terms of, of programs being a bit slower i know it has from my side um yeah. so just talk us about obviously your COVID experience, we had, <laughs> unfortunately, we, we managed to contract it last year, which wasn't the, the most fun thing we've ever done. Um, but yeah, after that, we've, we've recovered and, and now we're into a new season. Do you think it will get back to normal? Or, and what's your opinion on it? I, I would hope so, obviously, as everybody does. But as long as we can go racing in a safe environment, I, I think we can be really happy with that because traveling nowadays is not so easy, especially, I think, also from the UK, at least at, at the moment. I think as long as we can travel and do races, I would really highly appreciate that and <laughs> be happy already that just to make it happen, even if there would be no spectators, but no spectators is obviously a lot better than not going racing. Um, I'm going to do VLN, uh, now it's called the NLS um, and 24 hour river Ring again. And once again, trying to beat you there. <laughs> then um, <laughs> I'm doing the GT World Challenge endurance races, which I just figured out like an hour ago that it's five races this year because last year it was only four. Okay, this cool. year it's, it's, it's five because they added um, Barcelona once again, which was on the schedule a couple of years ago already. Yeah. So There's five races on that, then development of the GT3, which is a big part of it. Um, and let's see, hopefully GT Masters as well. It's not 100% sure yet, but um, I think it doesn't get boring. No, it um, sounds like it, particularly with the, like you said, with the development of the M4 and it being released to customers, as far as I know, yeah, towards the end of the year. I'm sure then actually yeah. we might we might be flat out through the winter as well, because obviously when, as, as the listeners may or may not know, once the car is ready, the factory drivers that have helped develop it usually go to those teams like like you have a, a lot. I remember Hopefully, you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, over here to, to Donington when uh, a new team bought a car, I think. You, do you, you remember, were, remember that? Yeah, yeah, of course I do. There was a Z4, yeah. It was, um, what was it called? A triple eight back then. They yeah, bought exactly. a Z4. And I, I went exactly. there for one day to Snapchat and to show them the car and give them some, some advices. Exactly. Ah, so I didn't know that. It's been a long this. time. Yeah, God. I know when the king is in England. Come on. Best track <laughs> in the world. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, uh, cool. Go on. Okay, then. Well, yeah, thank you very much for coming on. I think we can, we've covered so much stuff there that um, we can leave it there. So I really appreciate you coming on. I'll do my normal spiel and outro. So thank you very much, mate. Appreciate that. Uh, make sure you follow Jens on all social media and come back here next week for the brand new episode of the HYM podcast. Um, I'll leave Jens' details for his social media below. It's at Jens Klingman with a double N. Uh, <laughs> make sure also you, you check out all social media for the HYM podcast. And uh, yeah. Click, comment, subscribe, and uh, let us know what you think. Speak to you all soon, guys. Cheers. Cheers, Jens. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank you very much.